Wonder Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, Faith Perlo tells us why two huge ducks are floating in the waters of Hong Kong. Brian Lin presents this week's technology report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here is Faith Perlo. Two giant yellow ducks are floating in Hong Kong's Victoria Harbor. A huge air-filled rubber duck was very popular in the city's financial area ten years ago. Now there are two. This year, the ducks form an art exhibit called Double Ducks, by Dutch artist Florentine Hoffman. They look like traditional bath toys for children, but these ducks are over eighteen meters tall. Just after they were put into the water, many people gathered on the nearby walkway to take photos. The ducks will float on the harbor for two weeks, and Hoffman hopes they will bring happiness to the city, help create memories. And connect people. Hoffman says that the ducks stand for twice the fun and double the happiness. Double duck, double luck. I hope it will bring as much pleasure as it did in the past. All rights reserved is the Hong Kong-based artistic group that is supporting Hoffman's duck exhibit. The group said that the ducks were similar to the Chinese language characters for friends and happiness. Years ago, Hoffman took inspiration to create a giant duck from a world map, and of course, a rubber duck. He started his traveling show in the Netherlands in 2007. He put the duck in many harbors, including ones in France and Brazil. The double ducks are now floating near Hong Kong's central area and Tamar Park. The ducks are inspiring other artists like Lawrence Lai to capture the ducks in a different way. Lai is making watercolor paintings of the ducks. The fifty-year-old said that since the COVID-19 pandemic, Hong Kong has been full of negative energy, and thinks it is time for something different. With life returning to normal, the ducks can bring back some positivity. Lai said. Forty-year-old Kane agreed that the ducks were positive for Hong Kong. It's a silver lining when the society is in such low spirits. It's better that the government spends money on this than on other areas. Eva Yang is a tourist and Shenzhen resident. She and her family were excited to see the ducks. She said this has made their visit more memorable. They're spectacular, Yang said. Another woman, forty-year-old Anna, who was walking nearby, said that she also enjoyed seeing the exhibition. We would like more installation art, like the rubber ducks in Hong Kong. Right now, there isn't much space for art in Hong Kong, if we compare it to Macau or Shenzhen. They have more art installations, Anna said. Many people remember the joy that Hoffman's earlier duck 
brought to the Sim Sha Sui Pier and Shopping District in 2013. The tour of the original 2013 duck became political by accident on the social media service Weibo during the 24th anniversary of Beijing's Tiananmen protests in 1989. Internet users posted an image in which the military tanks, in the well-known Tank Man picture, were replaced with the giant yellow ducks. Chinese censors immediately blocked searches for the words Big Yellow Duck. I'm Faith Perlow. An American judge has temporarily blocked Microsoft's planned purchase of video gaming company Activision Blizzard. U.S. District Judge Jacqueline Scott Corley made the ruling Tuesday in San Francisco. Her decision came after the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, requested federal court action to block Microsoft's $69 billion deal. FTC officials have expressed concern that the purchase, also called an acquisition, would hurt competition in the video gaming market. Both Microsoft and Activision had signaled the deal could be completed as soon as June 16th. Corley said her ruling to temporarily halt the deal was necessary to maintain the status quo while the FTC's legal cases are still active. An earlier request by the FTC to block the acquisition will also be considered at a hearing set for June 20th. The FTC wants the deal to be blocked until the U.S. government has a chance to have its concerns about competition officially heard. Microsoft announced the proposed deal in January 2022. If approved, it would become one of the biggest technology deals in history. The deal is expected to improve Microsoft's position in competing with other major video game makers like China's Tencent and Japan's Sony. Activision Blizzard produces a series of popular and profitable video games. Among them are Call of Duty, Overwatch, World of Warcraft, and Candy Crush. Microsoft is expected to make those games and others available to subscription users of its Xbox gaming system. This has raised questions about whether Microsoft might restrict Activision games to its own Xbox system and Windows-powered computers. Some critics have also expressed concern that the deal could give Microsoft a favored position in the growing international cloud-based gaming market. The deal has faced intense opposition from competitors such as Japan's Nintendo and Sony. Microsoft sought to answer such criticism by signing a deal with Nintendo to license Activision games like the hugely popular Call of Duty for 10 years. Microsoft offered the same deal to Sony if the deal goes through. Last month, the European Union gave final approval to the Microsoft Activision Blizzard acquisition. 
The approval came after Microsoft made promises to support efforts to expand competition in the cloud-based gaming market. A number of other countries have also approved the deal. These include China, Japan, Brazil, and South Korea. But the acquisition still faces legal difficulties in Britain and the United States. Britain's Competition and Markets Authority has rejected the deal on grounds that it could harm competition. Microsoft filed an appeal of Britain's decision in late May, and protested the rejection to top government officials. If Microsoft were to close the deal without Britain's approval, it could face new legal difficulties there, or possibly decide to suspend its wider game business in the country. U.S.-based consumer group Public Citizen, an opponent of the deal, has welcomed the FTC's move. Microsoft is pushing to culminate the purchase of Activision before the agency can finish its process, said Public Citizen official Matt Kent. In the United States, the FTC already took Microsoft to court last year to block the acquisition. That case is set to go to trial on August 2nd at the FTC's in-house administrative court. The FTC has argued the deal would give Microsoft's Xbox system exclusive rights to Activision games. Microsoft President Brad Smith said in a statement. The company welcomes the chance to present Microsoft's case in federal court. Activision did not comment on the FTC's latest request. Microsoft officials have said the deal would benefit both gamers and gaming companies. When announcing the deal, Microsoft said it expected the acquisition. Would close in their 2023 fiscal year, which ends in June. I'm Brian Lynn. Brian Lynn joins me now to talk more about this week's technology report. Thanks for being here, Brian. Of course, Ashley. Thanks for having me. In your report, we learned that a U.S. judge has temporarily blocked Microsoft's planned deal to buy video gaming company Activision Blizzard. In what way is this delay? Likely to affect the overall deal. So the judge's ruling came in response to a request by the Federal Trade Commission, which expressed concerns that the deal will hurt competition in the international gaming market.、Um, the aim of the FTC request was to prevent the deal from being completed before those concerns can be heard in court. And since this temporary action will permit the legal process to move forward, it may raise new issues that could, in the end, permanently block the deal. The report notes that the FTC's latest request came as there were no signs the deal could be completed very soon. Correct. Yes, that is correct. In fact, both Microsoft and Activision had recently suggested the deal could be finalized as soon as this week, and that is really what the FTC was worried about—that the deal could close quickly without giving the legal process a chance to consider possible harms the acquisition could cause. 
Okay, well, thanks again for joining me, Brian, to discuss today's technology report. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. I'm Steve Ember. We look back at some of the social issues and cultural changes in America in the 1970s and 80s. In some ways, the 1980s seemed like the opposite of the 1960s. The 60s were years of protest for social justice and change. Many Americans demonstrated against the Vietnam War. Blacks demonstrated for civil rights. Women demonstrated for equality. Many people welcomed new social programs created by the government. By the 1980s, however, many people seemed more concerned with themselves than with helping society. To them, success was measured mainly by how much money a person made. People wanted to live the good life, and that took money. The changes started to become evident during the 1970s. For a while, these years brought a continuation of the social experiments and struggles of the 60s. But then people began to see signs of what society would be like in the 80s. There were a number of reasons for this change. One reason was the end to America's military involvement in Vietnam after years of war. Another was the progress of civil rights activists and the women's movement toward many of their goals. A third reason was the economy. During the 1970s, the United States suffered a recession. Interest rates and inflation were high. A shortage of imported oil as a result of tensions in the Middle East only added to the problems. As the 1970s went on, many Americans became tired of economic struggle. They also became tired of social struggle. They had been working together for common interests. Now, many wanted to spend more time on their own interests. This change appeared in many parts of society. It affected popular culture, education, and politics. Let me hear your idea again. Okay, I want us to watch Jack Lemmon and a group of famous scientists discuss pollution and ecology on Channel 13. Good. And I want to watch football highlights on Channel 2. Now, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> One of the most popular television programs of that time was a comedy series that often dealt with politics and serious social issues. The show was called All in the Family. The family was led by a factory worker named Archie Bunker. Carol O'Connor played Archie, and Gene Stapleton played his wife, Edith. The Bunkers lived in a working-class neighborhood in the Queens borough of New York City. Archie represented the struggles of the blue-collar working man against the social changes in America. He loved his country and was socially conservative in the extreme. What about John Wayne? <laughs> and before you say anything, let me warn you, when you're talking about the Duke, you ain't just talking about an act. You're talking about the spirit that made America great. <laughs> Are you kidding? His opinions on subjects like race and women's equality were always good for an argument with his liberal daughter and even more liberal son-in-law. Good, I can mail my letter today and it'll get to Washington by Monday. Washington? Are you writing to Washington? That's right, Michael wrote the president. You write to the president about what? 
all the things we've been talking about. The pollution of our air, the pollution of our water, the way us housewives have no protection from foods without nutrition, how they make products with harmful things in them. Like you saw what happened to Michael from that shirt. <laughs> you, Michael Stivic Meathead, you have the nerve to write to the President of the United States about your rash? Edith would always try to make peace. Maybe he knows a good skin man. <laughs> Another popular program, Happy Days, about family life in the 1950s, offered an escape from the social issues of the day. Music also changed. In the 1960s, folk music was popular. Many of those folk songs were about social issues. But in the 1970s, there was hard rock and punk. Here's Wonder Mike, Hank, and Master G, the Sugar Hill Gang. And in 1979, a group called the Sugar Hill Gang brought rap music to national attention with a hit called Rapper's Delight. And me, the groove, and my friends are gonna try to move your feet. You see, I am Wonder Mike, and I like to say hello. Up to the black, to the white, the red, and the brown, and the purple, and yellow. But first, I gotta bang, bang, the boogie to the boogie. Say up, jump, the boogie to the bang, bang, boogie, let's rock. In bookstores, the growing number of self-help books offered another sign of social change. These books advised people about ways to make themselves happier. One of the most popular self-help books was I'm Okay, You're Okay by Dr. Thomas A. Harris. It was published in 1969 and led the way for many other popular psychology books throughout the 70s. Politically, the United States went through several changes during the 1970s, for most of the 60s, the nation was governed by liberal democratic administrations. Then, in 1968, a conservative Republican, Richard Nixon, was elected president. Nixon won a second term four years later, but had to resign in 1974 because of the Watergate scandal. Nixon's vice president, Gerald Ford, took his place. Two years later, Ford was defeated by Jimmy Carter, a Democrat who, until then, was little known nationally. The election showed that Americans were angry with the Republican Party because of Watergate, but they soon became unhappy with President Carter. They blamed him for failing to improve the economy and for failing to end a crisis involving American hostages in Iran. He lost his re-election campaign to Ronald Reagan. Are you better off than you were four years ago? Reagan, a Republican, won two terms and led the nation during most of the 1980s. For many people the Reagan years offered a renewed sense of economic opportunity. Reagan reduced taxes, which increased his popularity. But the national debt grew as he raised military spending to put pressure on the Soviet Union. The self-centeredness of many people in the 70s and 80s gave rise to terms like the me generation. And there was the rise of yuppies, young urban professionals remaking older neighborhoods in cities, often displacing poorer people. Popular entertainment at that time was often about financial success. Premiering Sunday, April 2nd, Dallas, where money buys power and passion breeds conflict. Dallas was a TV drama about a Texas oil family with more money and more problems than they knew what to do with. 
It became a hit, not just in the United States, but around the world. Actor Larry Hagman played J.R. Well, your daddy lacked the killer instinct. He forgave those who transgressed against him. People just weren't afraid of him. And he overlooked old J.R.'s golden rules. And what might they be? Don't forgive and don't forget. And do unto others before they do unto you. And most especially, keep your eye on your friends because your enemies will take care of themselves. Oh, and one other thing. The old business is a little bit like poker game. It's good to get caught bluffing early on because after that, somebody's going to call you when you got a winning hand. Dynasty was another popular series about rich people behaving badly. One of its stars was veteran actor John Forsythe. Those banks are going to find out that they've got more than they can handle. Denver Carrington is Blake Carrington. And they'll come begging to me to run that company again. I know they will. And I'll make them get down on their knees when they come begging. There was also Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous a series about real-life wealthy people hosted by Robin Leach. Now a bustling capital city combines the chic with the freak, the old guard with the avant-garde. So let's go up a deck with a couple of my good friends and run away with the rich and famous. And at the movie theater, there was the 1987 film Wall Street. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Michael Douglas played a character named Gordon Gecko, who earns his wealth by raiding companies and illegally trading on inside information. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life for money, for love, knowledge, has marked the upward surge of mankind, and green, you mark my words, will not only save Teldar paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Thank you very much. Good triumphed over evil in the Rambo action films starring Sylvester Stallone. He played a troubled hero who had fought in Vietnam. The films were violent, but they represented a more positive view than society had shown in the past toward veterans of that unpopular war. In the 1980s, people came to fear a new disease that could be spread by sex or blood. It was the rise of the AIDS epidemic. At the same time, a new drug, crack cocaine, started a wave of violence in American cities. Technology was also on the rise. You don't have to be a genius to use a computer, but Computerland show you how easy it is to manage your own small business or home finances with the Atari 800. Record keeping, information, communication, and a world of new ideas from Atari. Personal computers appeared in more and more offices, schools, and homes. The 1980s brought stardom to young entertainer Michael Jackson. They don't want to ever And no history of the 80s would be complete without noting the rise of music television, better known as MTV.
And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 